Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. All right, I've got a couple things to accomplish today. One of them is I have to slow down. Valentin is up there translating and he said, hey, could you talk just a little bit slower? So I'm going to try to do that and I'm going to try to get you out on time. That may not be possible, but we're going to try. Okay, so we've been talking about Jesus in the Old Testament. We spent a lot of time talking about Joshua most recently. Then we talked about Ruth and what a kinsman redeemer is and how that points us to Jesus. And what we saw with Joshua is, is that he led the nation of Israel into the promised land. So here's the nation of Israel in the promised land. And you would think, man, things have got to be going just fantastic. But that's not the way it always works, right? The nation of Israel <coughs> sinned against God several times. They rebelled against God. God put judges over them. The book of Judges sort of covers a lot of those guys who judged the nation of Israel. And then uh, along comes this uh, story in, in 1 Samuel of this baby that is born. And his name is Samuel. And it's really a miraculous birth. And we could compare really Samuel to Jesus in some ways especially in the way that he was born and his ministry in a lot of ways. But uh, Samuel's mom couldn't have a baby, and she goes to the, to the temple and prays, and the, 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 the pastor thinks she's drunk. And she's like, no, I'm not drunk. I'm just crying out to God. I, I want a baby, and, and if I have a baby, I'll give him to the Lord. It's called a Nazarite vow. And God blesses her with Samuel, the prophet Samuel. And this, this marks this transition in the nation of Israel where they went from Judges to moving into prophets, where God would uh, let prophets speak uh, on behalf of the nation of Israel and speak on behalf of God to the nation of Israel. So Samuel was really a priest, he was a judge, and he was a prophet. He was all three of those things. And what we read as we read into Samuel is the priest that he was with when, when his, his mom gave him to the, to the Lord in the temple was Eli. And Eli's sons, who he had put over the temple, were not very good people, okay? They were doing a lot of bad things. And God punished the nation of Israel for that. They even punished Eli for not being the leader that he was called to be. So then God puts <coughs> into that place Samuel. And Samuel wants to, the, the nation of Israel to have this revival. So he, he calls the nation of Israel back to focus on the things that are important. I'm going to pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. It says, Then Samuel spoke to all of the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away your foreign gods and the asterisks from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Now here's what's happened. Because of the disobedience of Eli and his sons, and because of the disobedience of the nation of Israel, uh, the Philistines came and they conquered Israel. And they stole the Ark of the Covenant, which is the symbol of God's presence, right? This is where God's presence dwelled. And, and if, you, if you read 1 Samuel, those first seven chapters, it's kind of interesting. They take the Ark back to their place and put it in the temple where their gods are. And they come in the next day and their gods fell over. They stand him back up. They come in the next day and their gods fell over and his arms are broken off and his legs are broken off. Well, then they start getting these tumors all over them, and they're like, okay, we got to get this thing out of here. So they send it back. They send it back to the nation of Israel. They put it on these carts and just say, get out of here. And it ends up back in Israel in a guy's house. And, and Samuel's wanting to, to call this nation of Israel back. Listen, you've, you've sinned. You've turned from God. It says they've even worshipped these gods, maybe these even same gods that the Philistines were worshipping. And he says, I'm calling you back. I want you to return to the Lord. And I want, you, I want us to understand this. This call to return is a decision for us as well. Return to the Lord. We can go through times in our life, even in our Christian walk, where we drift away from God. And, and, and when we do that, we need to understand that God is calling us back to return to the Lord. And there's grace in that for us, right? God doesn't just give up on us. 
He's calling us back. And he says, if you return, then here's what I'm going to do. Uh, he says, I want you to turn your heart. I want you to turn it away from those gods and towards me and repent. And, and I'll, give you, uh, I'll, I'll let you be able to conquer the Philistines. Verse 4. <coughs> it says, so the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. So they repented. They made a decision. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to be all in. Verse 5. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said, There, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. So they've they've symbolically (coughs) given up food and water to God. We're going to trust you, God. For all that you've given us. You've brought us into this promised land. You've provided for us. This is sort of symbolic. This act of worship and repentance to pour out water and fast from food. Is that we're going to trust you God for life. So we see this revival of sorts take place. And and they go and they fight the Philistines and, and beat them this time. Why? Because they're being obedient to God. And it's not long after that we get to... The very next chapter in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to read this whole chapter. And when I look at this passage, when I studied this a while ago, a long time ago, to teach it to students, it was eye-opening, quite honestly. And it really shouldn't be. We, We know this truth, but I think it's going to really hit us in the face today. Okay, so I want you to see this. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. So sort of similar to Eli, Samuel's sons are not any better. And, and, And here's what we learn, really, is that the condition of the human heart, by and large, is not bent towards following God and sacrificing ourselves and living for other people, is it not? The, the, the bent of our heart is to serve ourselves, do what's best for me, and I'm going to get mine. And that's how these guys were living their life. It was for dishonest gain. They took bribes. They perverted justice for their gain. Verse 4. <clears throat> then the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now this is where the story gets interesting. The nation of Israel had been led by Eli, first of all. Well, all these judges, really back Moses on down. And they, they've seen how wicked people can inflict harm on people. So... They feel like these people, in a lot of cases, are representing God. I mean, Eli was a priest. Samuel was a prophet. And yet his sons were not ruling justly. And they look out at all these other nations around them and say, You know what? They've got kings. We want a king. And and here's literally what they're saying. Is that we want to be like everybody else. Now, do we not struggle with that sometimes in our own life, even as Christians, that we see how other people are doing things? Maybe we see how other people are prospering, and we just want to be like everybody else. But here's the thing. God called the nation of Israel to be something different. God had said he wanted to be their king. So so the nation of Israel is basically, they're rejecting God as their king and wanting an earthly king. Now, Now, think about the logic behind this, if you're just... If you're a logical person, think about this. Okay, all these judges have failed us. Samuel, his sons have failed us. Eli and his sons failed us. So let's get another man and put him on the throne. And let's follow him and maybe he won't fail us. Now, does that work? It doesn't work. I mean, we got an election coming up here in a couple of days. And we're going to have to vote for people. In a lot of cases, we're picking the lesser of the two evils, right? In a lot of ways. And, and this is the thing is that... If we count on our government and our leaders uh, to save us, we need to understand that they are flawed people just like us. We should put our hope in God. And this is what God's trying to get the nation of Israel to do. I want you to be different than all these other nations. I want to be your king. Let me lead you. But they wanted to be like all the other nations. And I, I want us to understand this. So what does God do in this moment? 
We know what God's will is, is that he wants to be the king, but the nation of Israel wants something different. Look at verse 6. It says, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. So Samuel's like, all right, I'm going to go talk to God. Verse 7, it says, and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. Now, this is very interesting. And this is the truth that I want us to see that we all should know, but I think it really slaps us in the face here. God wanted to be the nation of Israel's king, but the nation of Israel wanted a separate king. So what does God do? He says, if that's what you want, I will allow it. Now, what does that mean to us? That means if we choose to disobey God, you know what he's going to do? He's going to allow us to do that. If you want to disobey God and you want to rebel against God and you want to go against his word, he's not going to force you. He's not going to beat you down. Now, he's about to give them a pretty strong warning. He's about to tell them what's going to happen to them. But he allows them to have a king. Now, what does that, what does that look like in our day? Well, I, you know, I hear this all the time. Well, if God opens that door, I'll walk through it. We use the God's will as the open door policy. You ever heard that? And, and sometimes there's some truth to that, like God brings opportunities to us. But sometimes we use the God open the door policy for us to walk through doors that are opposite of what God wanted us to do. Sometimes we just want to do what we want to do. Sometimes we go to God's word looking for a verse that justifies our decision that we know sometimes is in opposition to his will. And God will allow it. If you want to go against God's will, he he will allow you to do that. And we do this. We justify our decisions in a lot of ways. Here's one. God just wants me to be happy. What, What verse is that? I mean... Paul was beaten, shipwrecked. I mean, where's that at? Well, God just wants us to love everybody, and we're in love. That's That's a classic one right there, okay? Just because you think you're in love with somebody doesn't mean it's God's will. Uh... We, we see this in a lot of ways, how we try to justify. And one of those ways is, well, everybody else is doing it. Well, people that go to that church are doing it, or we do it here, or whatever. I saw somebody else doing it. And we justify us and what we do by those things. And understand that God will allow you to do those things. So let's look at verse 6. It says, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Um, So Samuel prayed to the Lord. He said, heed the voice of the people, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. Verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Verse (coughs) 9, now therefore heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. He says, listen, you can allow it. We're going to allow this. We're going to give them a king. But here's what's going to happen. And here's what God's word does for us. He does the same thing for us. Just because we do something that is in rebellion of God and God is gracious, understand there are consequences to our sin. Do we we understand that? Yes, God will forgive our sins. But there are consequences to our sin. And sometimes those consequences don't just affect us. They affect our family. They affect our kids. They affect the people around us. Do, do we not see that? And, and, and God warns us of this. Yes, is God gracious? Yes, he is. And we're going to see God's grace in this story. But there are consequences to their sin. Look at verse 10. So Samuel <coughs> told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his own chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves, and give them to his servants." He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, 
your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys, and put them to his work. And he will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day, because your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. He said, listen, you're going to ask for a king, and it's not going to go the way you want. He's going to tax you, he's going to take your stuff, and he's going to use all of your stuff to serve him. And when you cry out to me, I'm not going to listen. I warned you. So what does the nation of Israel do? They have a, a choice to make. God has laid out the consequences of their sin. They understand that. So what's going to happen? Verse 21. Um, let's see here. Uh, verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us. That they may also be like all the nations. And that our king may judge over us and go up before us and fight our battles. Now this is real interesting right here. When the nation of Israel came out of Egypt, who destroyed the Egyptians? God. Who protected the nation of Israel in the, in the wilderness? God. When, when they used Joshua to cross over uh, the Jordan River and defeat Jericho, who defeated Jericho? God. Who just defeated the Philistines for them? God. And they said, you know what? We want a king to fight for us. Apparently God's record's not very good. So we're going to go with a king who's going to defend us. <coughs> we want to be like all the other nations. And see, we fall into this trap. We, when things don't go our way, and that's really what's happening here. Re the, the reason the nation of Israel is rebelling against God is, is number one, the... Uh, Samuel's sons were being disobedient. They were tired of failed leadership. And number two, they wanted to be like everybody else. And sometimes we fall into that trap that when things aren't going great, we just want what everybody else has got. Well, let's just blow the whole thing up and start over and maybe it'll be better. But God had a plan and they didn't stick with it. <coughs> Verse 21. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he re repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man go to his city. So what happens is Samuel appoints a guy named Saul to be their king. And quite honestly, Saul was, he was sort of chosen based on his appearance. He was tall, he was big, he was a big guy, head and shoulders above everybody else. He was sort of a man-chosen king. And it started out okay, but it really unraveled after that. They got exactly what God told them they would end up with. And we look at this and we say, okay, what does this mean for us? First of all, this is what it means. If you want to disobey God, he will allow it. But there will be consequences. So just because you think that you can do something doesn't mean that there won't be consequences or that it is God's will. The first and foremost thing we need to do is understand God's will. So when the, when the nation of Israel came to Samuel and they said, we want a king, what did Samuel do? Do you remember? He went to the Lord and he prayed. He wanted to know God's will. When the nation of Israel came to him, Samuel ran straight to the Lord. So what does that mean for us? Listen, when we want to know God's will, where do we go? We go to the Lord. He's already spoken in his word for us. And we can know his will. That's where it starts. All right? So, so this is what it means for us to understand what God's will is. Is first, we need to see what God's word says. Not what the nations around us are doing. Not what people at the other church are doing. Not what somebody across the aisle is doing. Not what the media says is good. We need to understand what God says and follow it first and foremost. <clears throat> and then we get to this whole idea and we look at... So, so the nation of Israel has chosen this king and God gave it to them. So, so what happens after that? Well, if you read the rest of the Old Testament, well, Saul tur turned out not to be a great king. So God appointed a man named David. David was different than Saul. David is considered to be a man after God's own heart. But, but if you read the story of David, you understand that, man, he had his problems too. Did he not? He had his problems. He had failed leadership in, in the way that he treated people. And then you read the rest of the Old Testament, and it's king after king after king who rebels against God. And you think, well, so, so if we make a bad decision and God allows it, is it over for us? 
Is that the end of it? Well, no, what we see is, is that God, even through this bad decision that the nation of Israel wanted and that he allowed, what we see is we see God's grace come to total fruition. That after failed king, after failed king, after failed king, there one day came the king of kings. That, that through a man like David and this line of kings, that although they were failed and although it came through about through a bad decision and through sin, God through that sin brought Jesus Christ, the king of kings. I want to show you a couple of verses here in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1. It says, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. See, in, 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 in Christmas, when we celebrate Christmas and the birth of Jesus, that's the true king. That's the gracious king. That's the king of kings. That's the Lord of lords. That's the righteous king who came. Even through this sinful decision. So here's what this means for you. Just because you've made a sinful decision in the past. And God allowed it. And things didn't work out the way you wanted to. And yes, there are consequences to your sin. Understand there is grace in Jesus Christ. And that grace comes through him. And it leads to restoration. That, that this has been God's plan all along. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 9. If you, if you read the book of Matthew, you're going to see this idea of the kingdom of God. When Jesus came, it, really, it literally meant that the kingdom of God was at hand. This is what he said a lot of times. The kingdom of God is at hand. And it came in Jesus Christ because he's the one who reigns. Look at Matthew chapter 9. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, what kingdom is he talking about? He's talking about the kingdom of God. What is the gospel? It is the good news of Jesus Christ. Then I'm going to show you what the good news of Jesus Christ here is in just a minute. <clears throat> but this has been his message all along. And later in that passage in Matthew chapter 9, it begins to show us what kind of king that Jesus was. Because it says that he looked out over the crowds and he had compassion on them. Because he saw people who were like a sheep without a shepherd. See, this king is different. Most kings take all your stuff to serve themselves. They will send your children to go die on the battlefield for them. This king is going to be different than that. This king is not about us serving him, but it's what he did for us. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. I mentioned this when I was baptizing Trish. Uh, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven... Uh, is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Now, here's what this verse is literally saying. Is that this man understood what the kingdom of God was like. A, a, a relationship with God Almighty, the creator of the universe through Jesus Christ. And he said it was like finding a treasure in a field. And he wanted it so bad that he sold everything he had to buy this field. Why? So he could get that treasure. And the reason I love this verse is because of one word. You know what it is? Joy. Following God is not some obligation like we think, well, i got to do that or God's going to punish me. No, we follow God and we have a relationship with God through joy. This guy willingly gave it all up to, to follow and be part of the kingdom of God in his Joy. This is the way God wants us to follow Him, is in joy. It should be a, in joy and honor and love that we follow Him. Matthew 27, 42. Jesus is being crucified. Uh, let, me, let me read 27, 11. It says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked Him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And He said, It is as you say I am. So here's Jesus testifying as to who He is. I am the king of kings. I am the king of the Jews. I'm going to ask TC to come up. I want to read one last verse. Matthew chapter 27, verse 42. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, 
He had already been mocked. People had already put a crown of thorns on his head and they had hit it on his head so that the crowns would go into his skull. They put purple robes on him. They had spit on him. If you're a king, did you see who hit you? All this stuff. They mocked him because he said that he was a king. They even put a sign on his cross making fun of him because he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And at this point in Matthew chapter 27, as he hangs on the cross, I want you to see this so that you can see what kind of king that we have. It says, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. Could have Jesus came down on the cross and saved himself? In a heartbeat. It tells us that he, earlier when he was in the garden, that he could have called legions of angels to come and rescue him. But he didn't. Why? Because this king is different. Where other kings take your kids, take them off to battle, and take your money and your taxes and use it for their good, this king came to give himself for you. This is the real king, the gracious king, the loving king, who instead of taking everything for himself, gave everything that he had for you. And that's the kind of king that we serve, and that's the kind of king that we love, and that's the kind of king that we can go And in order to find the kingdom of God, we can give it all up in joy to follow that kind of king. And and even though the nation of Israel disobeyed God and wanted a king back in 1 Samuel, it led to the king of kings. Jesus will come back one day and he'll (coughs) have written on his thigh, king of kings and lord of lords. And that's who we serve. But I want us to understand that even through our bad decisions, God brings mercy All right, will you stand with me? I'll finish with this. I want you to understand that the kingdom of God, there's joy and there's hope. There's joy that we can follow a king who's not uh, leading us with oppression and all those things, but he leads us out of love. But the other thing is, is that we have hope. That even though you've made a bad decision in your life, maybe, or you've followed... uh, The ways of the world instead of God, there's grace for each and every one of us. Why? Because our king gave himself up for us. Maybe you're here today and you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I would love to talk with you about that. Martin's in the back. I'll be down front. Maybe you want to join Refuge as a church. We would love for people to join our family. We think it's a big deal. Maybe you want to get baptized. Maybe you're like Trish and man, you just want to (coughs) make a public profession of faith. We would love to speak with you about that. But let me pray for us. God, we come to you today, God, just first of all, thankful that despite our own disobedience at times, despite our own, and sometimes, willingness, rejection, and rebellion against your way, that, that God, it's not over for us. It doesn't mark the end and, and, and all those things for us. That through that, you can bring grace. That, that through the worst thing that ever happened, an innocent man dying on the cross, a horrible event, you brought good out of something like that. That you can do that even in our own lives. That horrible things that happen in our lives, God, you can bring good through those things. And God, we're thankful. And we pray that, God, in our joy, that we would give all that we have to come and follow you. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.